Our previous examination into the difference between the boss that one works for because one has to and the boss that one works for because one wants to concluded that the difference is not the person's behavior, but actually the person's intent. The fundamental intent of a boss that you work for because you have to is that the boss is trying to get something from you. When you work for a boss because you want to, that boss is trying to give you something. We're now going to examine how that affects enterprises and groups. Successful enterprises produce profits. If one considered the enterprise from a broader point of view to include a socialist organization, then one would say that successful enterprises produce surpluses. Any enterprise that is successful, whether it's a capitalist company or a socialist cooperative, will produce surpluses. The question is, how does one produce a surplus? Let's assume we've got three bakers who cooperate to bake a cake. It's a very difficult cake to, uh, to bake. It takes them an entire month to bake the cake. And at the end of the month, the cake is sold. Once the cake is sold, Sally, the first baker, takes th this particular slice home to feed her family and herself. The second baker, Vusi, takes that slice home to feed his family. And the third baker, Krishna, takes that slice home to feed his family. The question is, if these, these were the three bakers who were involved in baking this cake, then the slice that is left is clearly the surplus. And in a sense, one measures the success of the enterprise on the basis of the size of that slice of the cake, the surplus, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the cake. The bigger the, the, that surplus slice is, the more successful we can deem the enterprise to be. The question is, why does that surplus exist in the first place? Surely that surplus only exists because the total cake that was baked was bigger than what each individual took home. In other words, collectively, have these people given more than what they've taken, or have they taken more than what they've given? And clearly, they've given more than what they've taken. That suggests, in other words, that a surplus is the direct measure of the degree to which the members of a group give unconditionally in pursuit of the objectives of the group. Now, this is true for any group. It doesn't matter what the nature of the group is. It's true, for example, for military organizations. In the Vietnam War, despite the fact that the Vietnamese had lost most battles in a two-decade period, they still won the war. If one applied this logic to a sporting environment, uh, what was interesting to me, for example, during the Soccer World Cup played in South Africa in 2010, was that most of the teams that were populated by stars failed. And that seems to suggest that when you populate a team with stars, you actually don't have a team, you've got a herd of cats. You only have a team based on the degree to which the individual in the team subordinates himself to the requirements of the team. In other words, he's not there to play for himself, he plays for something bigger than himself. He subordinates his own interests to the interests of the group. Any group succeeds based on that fundamental intent by the individual to make a contribution to the group and not just to get something out of the group. This intent to contribute is manifested in organizations with how people interact with each other. One way of looking at an organization is that it's purely a collection of people. However, this way of looking at an organization does violence to the truth because the organization isn't just constituted by a collection of bodies. It's actually constituted by how those people interact with each other over time. Which means to say that an organization is really a virtual pattern of transactions between individuals over a period of time. Each one of those points of engagement, each one of those transactions between individuals can have fundamentally one of two characters. It can either be fundamentally competitive or it can be fundamentally cooperative. It is fundamentally competitive when both of the people in the interaction come in, into, the, into the interaction to get something out of the other person to win or to come first. It only becomes cooperative when at least one of the individuals in the interaction comes into the interaction deliberately to set the other person up to succeed. It's this magnanimity of spirit that I'm here for something bigger than myself. I'm not just here to get something out of the organization that accounts for the success of groups. The 
the fundamental point to remember here is that people don't do this. They don't go the extra mile for organizations. People do this for people. In other words, the question to ask isn't what is the organization that people commit to and go the extra mile for, but to ask oneself what, who's the boss that people commit to and go the extra mile for.